and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 138, Trading Punches. Army Group North. Last time, a desperate Soviet counterattack just west of Lake Ilmen had finally held up the advancing Germans. To this point, Field Marshal Lieb's men and panzers had dashed forward some 450 kilometers, or 270 miles, stomping mostly of their own volition to crush pockets of resistance to their rear. But now, even though the German 8th Panzer Division had won here, almost half of some of the unit's tanks were wrecked hulls. This, along with stopping other Panzer units from crossing the Luga River to the northwest of this battle, meant that Lieb's men were now slogging their way forward, and were still some 100 kilometers from Leningrad. In Stalin's eyes, the counterattack had failed, but that's only because, as a military novice, he was hoping all the German forces near Lake Ilmen would be pushed back. But that's not how most victories go. The 8th Panzer Division had lost many tanks and were now crawling forward. To Zhukov's experienced eyes, compared to what had been happening, this was a victory. Yet Zhukov was not in charge of the country. So within days of the counterattack, Stalin had called the Chief of Army General Staff and General Vorshilov, responsible for the Northern Front, to his presence to berate them for their lack of toughness. Yet the men had done more than slap the nose of the leading panzers. Ever more defensive works were ordered along the Luga line and along the three other lines behind it. Also, the command structure in the area had been simplified, which increased the reaction time of local leaders dealing out their orders and the complying of such orders by the officers and men below them. But there was one major advantage to Stalin yelling at the men for their lack of progress. He personally ordered more reinforcements to the threatened areas. During the end of the first week of August, Brigadier Pronin's 34th Army was sent to the Staria Rusa area just below Lake Ilmen, and Lieutenant General Asimov's 48th Army was to head just north of the lake. On the other side of this fight, the day after the Russian counterattack ended, July 19th, Hitler had issued Directive No. 33. This was to launch his attack against Leningrad proper. The city had to fall before Moscow was attacked. It was a self-imposed condition of Barbarossa. To help achieve this, Berlin instructed that Army Group Center's 3rd Panzer Group, currently fighting its way to Smolensk, to turn north and help encircle Leningrad. Of course, it hadn't been reached yet, but that's what generals in the field were for. The Nazi warlord expected the encirclement to commence around August 8th. The order had been given, so let it be done. But of course, being a typical Hitlerian order, it also covered the broad strokes for the men of Army Group North. The main assault was to take place between the coast and Lake Ilmen. However, not putting all his eggs in one basket and thinking of the link between Leningrad and Moscow, there was also to be a secondary attack just south of the lake. This would make sure that the various defending positions could not support each other against one attack. As further insurance, the main attack would come along the Luga defensive line, but not just in one area. As the bridges across the Luga River, already in German hands, were to be crossed, there would also be a concentrated assault near the coast towards Kinkasep. As Hitler saw it, giving Lieb more detail than the general asked for, while three shock troops from Hoppner's Panzer Group and Kukler's 18th Army hit along the relative center of the Luga defensive line, again across various bridges, Bush's 16th Army would hit the Soviet defenses just south of Lake Ilmen. This would keep those forces tied down, should Hoppner's Panzers break through, or the 41st Motorized and the 38th Army Corps also belonging to Hopner, breached the line further north, near the coast. If all went according to plan, and it was too early into Barbarossa to think otherwise, the 56th Motorized Corps, with the recently mauled 8th Panzer Division held in reserve, 
would smash through the Luga line and head for Leningrad. Meanwhile, the 41st Motorized and 38th Army Corps, once across the Luga, would lunge north and take Kingisett. This left what we can call the Southern Group of Army Group North of the 1st and 20th Army Corps to swing around Lake Ilmen, move north, and link up with the Finns around Lake Ladoga. But as wide as this general attack was going to be, its flanks had to be protected. Lieb's left flank would be covered by the 18th Army as it raced north into Estonia, making for the coast to Tallinn. To the right, the German 16th Army was to invade and take control of the area to the south of Lake Ilmen, which would mean destroying the Soviet 11th, 22nd, 27th, and 34th Armies. The Germans didn't know their exact designations, just that there were a lot of Russian forces to the south of the lake. But if the Germans could pull this off, then the rail link between Leningrad and Moscow would be cut, and panzers would be on their way to begin the encirclement of Leningrad. Yet Moscow knew this was coming. Not exactly who would be where, but surely the Germans were coming for Leningrad to cut it off from Moscow. So other counterattacks were quickly organized. Orders went out from the Stavka to Vorshilov and Lieutenant General Vatutin, who were to use the 11th, 27th, 34th, and 48th Armies to hit the German 16th Army, making for the area south of Lake Ilmen. However, as there, the Russians' attack was about to start on August 12th, they found themselves instead reacting as the Germans launched their attack two days before this. The Soviet 27th Army, coming west, about a 100 miles south of the lake, hoping to sneak in behind the Germans by coming through a territory that was practically in between the land responsible by the Army Group North and Army Group Center, found themselves severely checked by the Germans at Kolm. However, the Soviet 34th Army did better, coming just south of the lake. The 34th was able to penetrate far enough to the lake's southwest corner, which allowed them to threaten the rear of the main panzer group attacking Novgorod, just above the lake. But then the 34th itself was checked. This counterattack looked like it would become another one of those failures that would see the Germans holding the field, but severely mauled for their hollow victory. But then, Soviet inexperience, along with German reinforcements, or rather, the experienced German officers skillfully moving around men and tanks that could afford to be moved, saw the Russian attack begin to founder around August 15th. The Russians had had various German forces isolated by terrain, which was their best chance of success, but were unable to focus their attacking power through proper control and command of their numerous forces. In the end, by August 25th, the Soviet 11th and 34th armies south of the lake suffered massive casualties, their remains pushed far back. Again, the Soviets had lost, but again, they hadn't. It was clear to the OKH back in Berlin that Leningrad could not be encircled, that the city and the capital could not be cut off from each other, until the area to the south and east of Lake Ilmen was cleared of any serious resistance. So, the 56 motorized and 10th Army Corps were sent there, and this is what's important, not towards Leningrad, to clear the area. And they would mostly succeed. Diamask, some hundred miles southeast of the lake, was captured on August 31st. But this used up valuable time in doing so. The remaining Soviet armies in the area were mauled further and pushed back even more as the gap between Army Group North and Army Group Center was closed. But more days were ticked off the calendar and the Russian winter was now that much closer. During all this, to the northwest of Lake Ilmen, near the coast, the attacks towards Leningrad were resumed. Two motorized army corps, the 41st and 38th, pressed towards Kingisap, after smashing their way across the Luga. This started at the end of the first week of August. 
The Russians reacted accordingly by moving forces into the area and in between the coast and Leningrad. But that was what the units of General Manstein's 56th Motorized and the 28th Army were waiting for. Because two days after the attack started to their north, Manstein's forces moved against the bridges in front of them and drove for Novgorod, just above the lake. While this was going on, other army corps were able to take other bridges over the Luga and penetrate towards Leningrad proper. The Russians threw in whole armies, and between them and the heavy rains, the Germans were slowed down, but they didn't stop. At one point, the 8th Panzer Division, still sitting in reserve and licking their wounds from the last Russian counterattack, was called north to help push back the Russians, now that the Panzers were across the Luga to the north. When the Germans reached an area just to the east of King Gazette, near the coast, the Panzers continued east, ever reaching for Leningrad, but the infantry turned west to clear up the territory now in the tank's rear. But this cleansing would not be that easy, and this phase of the battle went from a slug match to a chess game. Now that the cities near the coast were threatened, the Soviet 8th Army further west at Narva and Tillin were useless. So they were ordered to move east to help at Kinkasep, which meant that a rather strange battle was forming up over the city, with the Russians coming from the west and the Germans from the east. And try as they might, the Panzers moving east towards Krasnogvardisk in trying to get closer to just south of Leningrad could not shift the Russian resistors. Those other defensive rings were starting to pay off. What the Panzers needed was infantry support, but they were still busy trying to capture Kinkasep by destroying the Soviet infantry protecting it. Lieb recognized there was nothing for it. Some of the Panzers were brought back to reduce this latest stubborn Soviet resistance around the city. The city was taken before August was over, but those remaining Soviet forces simply moved to the Luga line and positioned themselves there. True, the Germans had forces beyond this line by swinging around Lake Ilmen and by punching holes in the Luga line, like the one just above the lake, but they were only just holes. Still, Lieb now used his freed-up infantry to expand these holes, and by the end of August, the Luga defensive line was in shambles. It had been penetrated in various places, and both ends were in German hands. Yet the 6,200 Russian soldiers, with their 5,000 rifles and 31 artillery guns along the river, held on as best they could. The Germans to the south of Leningrad were just 40 kilometers away. Those to the southwest were about 100 kilometers away. But they were moving closer. The Stavka made more changes to the commanders in the area, as well as the overall command structure of the Northwestern Front, now renaming it the Leningrad Front. They also brought in three fresh but untested armies to make sure the Germans and Finns did not link up just east of the city. If that were to happen, there would be no way to get supplies to the people there, which would allow them to continue to defy the invaders. Army Group Center Last time, Hoth's 3rd Panzer Group had crossed the Berenzina River east of Minsk, and then having more trouble with thunderous rainstorms and rickety old wooden bridges than the Russians, moved to pace. But once they cleared the river, they were met by several Russian armies and 2,000 tanks. Yet as impressive as these numbers were, Hoff made short work of them. The battle raged for five days, but only proved to demonstrate that how one used what one had made much more of a difference than how many of what one had. The Soviet riflemen were shattered, as were over 800 of their tanks. The men and remaining armor retreated. The way to the Vena further east was open. Hoth's panzers were back on the move by July 3rd. Yet, with their latest victory, 
the men and panzers of Hoth now had to battle against the Russian road system. The German standing order was that the panzers had the exclusive rights to the best roads. The term best is relative here, which left the supporting infantry units to make their way as best they could in the fields, which usually meant mud. The mud and non-human creatures that came out at night kept the men busy with their guns, so the infantry wasn't getting the rest planned for. As for the panzers, the mud, even along the area's best roads, was slowing them down. Hoth's plans was to have his panzers cross the Vena near Vitesk and Polosk, but because the going was so slow, he knew the Russians would be waiting for him along the river, if not before. More Soviet armies to smash. Yet, there weren't supposed to be any serious enemy troops here, but there always were. Hoth needed his infantry armies with him, and as they trapped Soviet troops around Bielishtok had finally been done away with, the men, his men, were on the move. But they would have to walk their way east. Waiting for Hoth's panzers were five overstrength new Soviet armies along the Vina at Polosk. But while they were not attacked head-on, given the lack of infantry, the Germans had taken Disna, just to the west of Polosk. And as the Vena flowed, when that town fell and the two bridges there could be rebuilt, the Germans would cross there, drive east, and find themselves on the eastern side of the Vena. So if the Russians could not be chased away with a head-on attack at Polosk, there was now an opportunity to hit them on their side of the river. At Vitesk, the 7th Panzer Division found themselves facing General Konev's 19th Soviet Army along the river. The 7th Panzer could not force the crossing alone, and so pulled up to wait for the infantry of Colonel General Strass. Yet Hoth knew he couldn't wait out the time it would take those men to walk to the Vena, so chose another way to take the city. He ordered the 20th Panzer Division and the 20th Motorized to cross upriver of Vitesk at Ula. But waiting for this attacking force was the 62nd Rifle Corps. Soviet Russian riflemen seemed to be everywhere. The two forces smashed at each other from July 5th to the 7th, but the Russians would not give up the waterway. Then two waves of assault boats were sent across, and though they suffered unacceptable losses, eventually reduced the bunkers on the other side. On July 8th, Vitesk was attacked from behind. Counterattack followed counterattack, but the Russians, besides having the numbers, did not have enough of everything else to make a success of it. The defensive line near the city was breached. Army Group South Last time, the Germans had finally had a positive resolution to the stubborn Russian 6th and 12th armies in southern Russia, near the Romanian border and the Dnieper, i.e. their destruction and capture. What's more, the city of Uman, another major city in the Ukraine, south of Kiev, had fallen. This was by the end of the first week of August. But before this, other events were playing out around Kiev, that would leave a massive hole in the Russians' defense of its southern front. Back in late July, as Kleist's forces were heading south to help trap the Soviet 6th and 12th Armies, Reichenau's 6th Army had turned north to protect Army Group South's left flank near and above Kiev. This put Reichenau's 29th Army Corps in front of Lt. Gen. Lazov's 37th Army, that seemed to have come out of nowhere. It was, in fact, a newly formed army. Vlavzov's men were directly in front of Kiev, but there were additional forces in front of them. Namely, again, Lazov's 51st and 17th Army Corps. Though they were stationed to the northwest and north of Kiev, just below the Pripyat Marshes. Ever the broken record, the Stavka, read Stalin, ordered the forces to counterattack the Germans threatening Kiev. 
the trouble to the south was plain out, but had all the hallmarks of another disaster. Still, Stalin wanted the southern front and the southwestern front to join forces to help the doomed 6th and 12th, as well as to take Zotormir to the southwest of Kiev that had recently fallen into German hands. But the two trapped, so useless Soviet armies made this order less than meaningless. Since the southern and southwestern front would not be joining up, this meant that Popotov's 5th Army would be attacking on their own, which started up on August 4th. On came Major General Yusenko's 1st Airborne Corps, along with the 15th and 31st Rifle and the 9th and 22nd Mechanized Corps. But once again, leadership and experience of the German persuasion carried the day. Three days into the counteroffensive, the Soviets accomplished little, except to have many of their own men now dead, along with many of their own machines now destroyed. But once the Germans deflected this attack, those forces to the northwest of Kiev went on their own limited offensive and captured Korosten, a city to the northwest of Kiev. This, along with Zitormir, south of Korosten, now meant that the way to Kiev was truly in German hands. With mid-August coming, with the two destroyed Soviet armies in the south, with this latest defeat to the west and northwest of Kiev, there was now a large hole in the Soviet defensive line to the south of Kiev. Newly formed Soviet armies would be rushed in to fill the gaps, but they would be hardly trained and barely equipped. For now, the remnants of the Soviet 9th and 18 armies of the Southern Front were pulled back to the Dnieper, but this time they had German forces right on their heels. On the maps back in Berlin, this theater looked like it would go the way of northern and western France, or like the initial successes of Army Group Center, with the panzers eating up hundreds of kilometers a day. But to guarantee success, here and for the Army Group North, Hitler ordered that panzers from Army Group Center be given over to the other two army groups. This directive of Hitler's would cause a cautious storm in Berlin and among the Army Group Command Headquarters out on the field. Army Group Center had had its amazing success due to its panzers, so it was predicted by some that its very success would change, not for the better. But what's more, those who worked with the tanks knew they needed rest and repaired, not sending them out north and south to continue fighting against other Soviet fronts. But Hitler had made up his mind. Meanwhile, Zhukov, looking at his map, saw that the end of Kiev was coming. And since there was no use in fighting a lost cause, he advised the Stavka to abandon Kiev, to pull back all Soviet forces across the Dnieper. Kiev was on the western side of the waterway. To reinforce the northern front, thereby protecting Leningrad and allow the Germans to smash themselves against massed artillery as they tried to cross over bridges. Not sexy, but effective. At least the last few weeks had shown this. But Zhukov was a general, whereas Stalin was a politician. Zhukov's advice was ignored. How would it look to Britain and the United States, who were currently shipping supplies to their new ally, to give up such a major city without a fight. Besides, Stalin did not see what Zhukov saw as touching the immediate future of Kiev, as much as the general tried to explain himself. Instead, Stalin removed Zhukov as the chief of the general staff, gave him control of the reserve front, and put General Shepov-Nishkov in his place. Even before this new chief of the army general staff sat down behind his desk, he looked over the latest maps and told Stalin that Zhukov had been correct. Kiev would fall. But Stalin was convinced that the Germans would now continue to push on towards Moscow. And in part, he was correct. For that's what Hitler was planning to do next. Back in Berlin, the generals gingerly told their Fuhrer 
that, according to the tenets of Barbarossa, Moscow could not yet be moved against, as there were still enemy armies on the western side of the Dnieper. But that's not how Hitler saw it. German panzers were just miles from Leningrad. Kiev was about to fall. The area to the south of it was wide open. No, now was the time to move on the Soviet capital. So, why was he taking panzers from Army Group Center, whose job it was to conquer Stalin's seat of power? Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, it's been a while since we've done a drawing, so I figured it's time. However, this one has a twist. What I'm going to be doing is giving away uh, Harry's uh, package, and it's called of course, the Winston. And those of you who have been following me on Facebook, you might have seen this by now. So what I'm going to do probably September 18th, so it can come out on the 19th show right before my birthday, is do a drawing and give this away. It's uh, the handle, three blades, and a container of foaming shave gel. So, uh, But the trick is, this is only open to the members of the History of World War II podcast. So if you've been thinking about it, um, now's the time to join up. Um, I think there's like 63 episodes there just waiting for you, and you'll be in the drawing for this uh, pretty nice shaving kit. So again, if you're thinking about it, just go to worldwar2podcast.net, sign up for membership, get 63 more episodes to listen to, and be in the drawing for a Harry's shaving kit.